In this time of almost total war, we hear little talk of peace. There's a perception now that peace is merely the absence of war. And since war has become perpetual, peace is unknown. Young people today can't remember a time of genuine peace between the human nations, and even those of us who were around then barely remember what it's like. But peace is far more than just a gap between two wars. I'm going to borrow parts of an excellent speech, dropping or moving a few words for clarity and context without changing any meaning, to discuss what genuine peace really is, what it really isn't, and how we can all work toward it. Please listen not to my voice, but to the meaning behind the words. You may recognize the speech and the person who gave it, which I'll talk about after I've read it. I've chosen this time and place to discuss a topic on which ignorance too often abounds and truth too rarely perceived. And that is the most important topic on earth, peace. What kind of a peace do I mean? And what kind of peace do we seek? Not a Pax Americana forced on the world by American weapons of war. Not the peace of the grave. Not the security of the slave. I'm talking about genuine peace, the kind of peace that makes life on earth worth living, the kind that enables men and nations to grow, to hope, and to build a better life for their children. Not merely peace for Americans, but peace for all men and women. Not merely peace in our time, but peace for all time. Total war makes no sense in an age when a single nuclear weapon contains ten times the explosive force delivered by all the Allied air forces in the Second World War. It makes no sense in an age when the deadly poisons produced by a nuclear exchange would be carried by wind and water and soil and seed to the far corners of the globe and to generations yet unborn. Today, the expenditure of billions of dollars every year on weapons acquired for the purpose of making sure we never need to use them is essential to keeping the peace. But surely the acquisition of such idle stockpiles, which can only destroy and never create, is not the only, much less the most efficient, means of assuring peace. I realize that the pursuit of peace is not as dramatic as the pursuit of war, and frequently the words of the pursuer fall on deaf ears. But we have no more urgent task some say that it's useless to speak of world peace, or world law, or world disarmament, and that it will be useless until foreign leaders adopt a more enlightened attitude. I hope they do. I believe we can help them do it. But I also believe that we must re-examine our own attitudes, as individuals and as a nation, for our attitude is as essential as theirs. Every thoughtful citizen who despairs of war and wishes to bring peace should begin by looking inward, by examining his own attitude toward the possibilities of peace, toward conflicts with other nations, and toward freedom and peace here at home. Let's examine our attitude toward peace itself. Too many of us think it's impossible. Too many think it unreal. But that is a dangerous, defeatist belief. It leads to the conclusion that war is inevitable, that mankind is doomed, that we are gripped by forces we can't control. We need not accept that view. Our problems are man-made and therefore can be solved by man. And man can be as big as he wants. No problem of human destiny is beyond human beings. Man's reason and spirit have often solved the seemingly unsolvable, and we believe they can do it again. I am not referring to the absolute infinite concept of peace and goodwill of which some fanatics dream. I don't deny the value of hopes and dreams, but we merely invite discouragement and incredulity by making that our only goal. Let's focus instead on a more practical, more attainable peace, based not on a sudden revolution in human nature, but on a gradual evolution in human institutions, on a series of concrete actions and agreements in the interest of all concerned. There is no simple, single key to this peace, no grand or magical formula to be adopted. Genuine peace must be the product of many nations, the sum of many acts. It must be dynamic, not static, changing to meet the challenge of each new generation. For peace 
is a process, a way of solving problems. With such a peace, there will still be quarrels and conflicting interests, as there are within families and nations. World peace, like community peace, does not require that each man love his neighbor. It requires only that they live together in mutual tolerance, submitting their disputes to a just and peaceful settlement. And history teaches us that enmities between nations and individuals don't last forever. However fixed our likes and dislikes may seem, the tide of time and events will often bring surprising changes in the relations between nations and neighbors. So let us persevere. Peace not need be impracticable, and war need not be inevitable. By defining our goal more clearly, by making it seem more manageable and less remote, we can help all peoples to see it, to draw hope from it, and to move irresistibly toward it. Should total war ever break out again, and some believe this inevitable, all we have worked for would be destroyed in the first 24 hours. And even in this Cold War, which brings burdens and dangers to so many, we're devoting massive resources to weapons that could be better devoted to combating ignorance, poverty, and disease. We're caught up in a vicious and dangerous cycle in which suspicion of one side breeds suspicion of the other, and new weapons beget counter-weapons. In short, we have a mutually deep interest in a just and genuine peace, and in halting the arms race. And if we can't end our differences now, at least we can help make the world safe for diversity. For, in the final analysis, our most basic common link is that we all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's future. And we are all mortal. We must deal with the world as it is, and not as it might have been had the history of the last decades been different. We must persevere in the search for peace, in the hope that constructive changes within our enemies might bring within reach solutions which now seem beyond us. We must conduct our affairs in such a way that it becomes in their interest to agree on a genuine peace. Above all, while defending our own vital interests, superpowers must avert confrontations which bring an adversary to a choice of either a humiliating retreat or total war. To adopt that kind of course in the nuclear age would be evidence only of the bankruptcy of our policy or of a collective death wish for the world. When John F. Kennedy spoke these timeless words more than half a century ago, they were welcomed, cheered, admired, and recorded for all time. But were they heeded? The Cold War continues unabated to this day, and the arms race has only intensified. The world hasn't known peace in decades now. We are a species at perpetual war with itself. President Kennedy's clear strategy of a gradual, organic, and lasting shift toward peace and liberty got him killed, and it was never implemented. It wasn't compatible with the plans of those in power behind the scenes, plans that have darkened our world ever since. Kennedy cautioned against sudden revolution in human nature as the way toward peace, but at this late and desperate hour, that now appears to be our best shot. I still believe we must work toward changing attitudes, slowly adjusting laws and traditions and perspectives, and forming a peace through the sum of many concrete positive actions. But after 53 years, have we moved any closer to genuine peace or only further away? In 2016, China, Russia, and the USA are increasingly threatening each other with total nuclear war literally promising to end all human life, and it's just a matter of when. This madness must end. JFK's simple message of love and peace and humanity rings true. It's infectious, and it's practicable. This simple message has been hidden, silenced, and kept out of the mainstream for decades. Speaking it aloud here to my small audience is one way I'm changing that. Your help will be appreciated and will benefit us all. Peace.
I'm ready.